Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Home Discovery Series. Today's program is Rosalie Edge, Raptor Hero, with Lisa Kahn Schnell, author, illustrator, and Hawk Mountain volunteer. Hi everybody. <laughs> My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And also joining us today is a very special guest, Deborah Edge, the granddaughter of Hawk Mountain's founder, Rosalie Edge. Hi, great to be here. And we are so happy that everyone is joining us today for this awesome and fun program. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first sanctuary for birds of prey. But what does it mean to be a sanctuary? Well, it means to be protected. And at Hawk Mountain, all of nature is protected. The birds, the wildlife, the plants, the forests, and the mountain. And we work with our neighbors as well as people all over the world to study, protect, and teach people about raptors. And raptors are birds of prey like hawks, falcons, eagles, and more. Today's program is being recorded, so you are welcome to watch it anytime you like on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel. And if you have questions, you can type in your questions uh, in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom platform. And at the end of the program, we're going to take some questions from the audience. We are so excited that Lisa is joining us today to teach us the story about how Hawk Mountain was created by Rosalie Edge, a true raptor hero. And another really cool thing is that we are going to learn how to actually draw a raptor together. So make sure that you have some paper available and also make sure that you have a pencil and eraser or even a pen so you're ready for the drawing section. So that's gonna be really fun. And before we get started, I'd like to share with everyone some information about Lisa. She has some really cool things that she's been working on. So Lisa writes and illustrates children's books about nature, and she is now working on a children's book about Rosalie Edge, the lady who created Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And Lisa loves Hawk Mountain. She's been volunteering at the sanctuary for 18 years, helping out in a lot of different areas, including Keeper of the Gate, the bookstore, the Native Plant Garden, and also helping out with our science team on the Broad-Winged Hawk Project, as well as the Goshawk Project. Lisa has also worked as a seasonal educator at Hawk Mountain for many years. But that's not all. Lisa loves animals and has a lot of pets at her, at her home, like a cat, a bunny, a fish, a turtle, and 13 teen chickens. So Lisa, just be expecting a visit from me sometime to meet with <laughs> animals. So Lisa, I heard that you have recently published a really awesome children's book about horseshoe crabs. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that with us? Sure. Um, this is my book, High Tide for Horseshoe Crabs. Um, and I published several books, but that one seems to be pretty popular. Um, it's also appropriate right now because this is horseshoe crab season. If you live on the east coast of the United States and you can get out to um, the, the ocean or especially um, Delaware Bay at, at high tide, new moon, full moon, it's a great time to see horseshoe crabs spawning. It's a really exciting wild animal event that you can enjoy right, right now. So. Awesome. That book looks amazing. And so if people are interested in purchasing, purchasing your book, how can they do that? Uh, it's available wherever books are sold. So wherever you like to get your books, I like to support independent bookstores, but um, whatever your preference is, is great. And a lot of libraries carry it also. So it should be available for you to see. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So Lisa, can you teach us more about the story behind how Hawk Mountain Sanctuary was created? And we all want to learn more about this awesome raptor hero, Rosalie Edge. I would love to talk about Rosalie. Um, I wanna first just share a couple of thank yous. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I wanna thank some of the people who were able to make this program possible. Um, and, okay. 
Okay, there we go. So you have helped me um, recently or long ago in big ways and small ways, but I just wanna say thank you to all of you for making this program possible. And we are here today to talk about um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, especially the remarkable woman, Rosalie Edge. And one of the things I admire most about Rosalie, one of the things that I think makes her a hero to me um, is that she believed that all animals should be treated with fairness and respect. They all deserved a peaceful place to live um, a good life. And she believed this with her whole heart. Um, and she dedicated her life to making that, making that come true. So we're gonna talk about her today. And also, as Jamie mentioned, at the end, we're gonna draw an actual raptor. Um, a drawing is one of those things that helps you see the world a little bit differently and you can pay attention to the details. And I can tell you that Rosalie Edge definitely saw the world differently from most people and she absolutely paid attention to the details. Um, so even though Rosalie was not an artist, as far as I know, um, she definitely used those skills. So have your paper and pencil ready. You don't need anything fancy. All right, let's go back here and take a look at this place where we are. This is a picture of North Lookout at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, it's a very, it's a great place to see the birds, um, especially when they're migrating in the in the fall. It's um, Hawk Mountain is a terrific place to go for a hike or go to a camp, um, go to a program. Hawk Mountain has been called the school in the clouds, and right now you might be getting almost used to the idea of school on the cloud and the internet cloud. Um, but this is totally different. This is getting outside. Hawk Mountain is all about getting outside into nature and sharing this place that we love with other people who feel the same way. And for, it's located in Pennsylvania. Um, and for over 85 years now, people have been coming here to, to see the birds and um, enjoy this place that Rosalie was able to help establish. So next I'm gonna show you a picture of Rosalie. Here we go. There she is. There's Rosalie. So in many ways, um, especially on the outside, Rosalie might seem like a very serious and proper person. And, and she was. She liked nice clothes and she liked hats. You can see the beautiful dragonfly pin that she's wearing on her suit there. Um, she was very careful with her words. She was not one to scream or yell. She was always very, very polite. But in other ways, Rosalie Edge broke a lot of rules. Um, when her heart told her that something was unfair, she did everything that she could to make the situation better. And she did that even if other people sometimes got a little mad at her. Um, okay, so Rosalie, for example, was born in a time when women did not even have the right to vote. Um, that meant that only men were making decisions in communities, in cities, in, really in our entire country. And that is definitely unfair. Um, Rosalie was able to join the fight to help women get the right to vote, also called women's suffrage. And while she was doing that, she listened to the stories that women had. She was able to turn those stories into headlines, into information that got people's attention. And she also learned how to organize people and how to get leaders to care about the things that she was really believed were very important. So eventually women did get the right to vote and now they're able to do all sorts of things. Um, thanks to Rosalie and the many other women who, who fought that fight, um, it, women are able, able to do many other things that they couldn't before. And that seems much more fair. So we have to th say thank you to Rosalie for that. Now, when Rosalie was a little girl, she loved spending time with her dad. Um, when she was sad, he was often able to cheer her up, and often they went to the park together. They lived in New York City, big city with a really big park called Central Park, and often they would go for walks, and she really enjoyed that. Now, later on, as a grown-up, sometimes she was sad, too, that happens, and she went back to Central Park and spent time there, and she ended up meeting um, people who were watching birds with binoculars. They were birders. Um, she stopped and she watched with them and suddenly those things that she was feeling sad about kind of drifted away and she felt much better. So she kept going back and she got to know some of these people, these birders, some of them were scientists. She got to learn more about the birds and other animals. 
um, some of them, she discovered, were animals that needed help. Now, people often like to help animals that are really big or really fluffy and cute, um, but Rosalie, remember, believed that all animals deserve to be treated with respect. That is what makes her a hero, because she thought differently than other people did. Um, so, for example, let's go back to the slide here. Here are some examples of animals that Rosalie was interested in helping to save. Now, some of these you might say, gosh, they're really common. But Rosalie often repeated a line that one of her scientist friends said, which is the time to save a species is while it's still common. So Rosalie fought for these animals, even though some of them might be a little scary or stinky or ugly, you might, you might not be very interested in them, but Rosalie fought for them to be protected all the same. Um, she also, um, remember she was watching those, those pretty birds, but even though most people said that they liked birds, um, they mostly meant the pretty little songbirds like you might see at your bird feeder. They were thinking about like cardinals and bluebirds and really colorful small birds that eat, you know, insects, tiny insects or seeds or that kind of thing. Well, Rosalie was interested in all birds, and that was not a very common way of thinking at that time, because Rosalie even loved raptors. And we're going to talk briefly about raptors and what makes a bird a raptor. How is a raptor different from other birds? And I've got some more pictures to show you here. Okay, there we go. There's our raptors. So, um, raptors can be big, they can be small. Um, often they're not very colorful, they tend to be different shades of brown and white, gray and black, but you can see the exception in the upper right hand corner there, that little kestrel is very brightly colored. Um, but one thing that raptors all have in common is their eyes, they all have very sharp eyesight because these birds are hunters, they're looking for wild animals to eat. And you need to be able to have sharp eyesight to detect movement, because remember, if it moves, something moves, it's probably alive, and if it's alive, you can eat it. Um, they also, raptors also have um, sharp talons, because they need to be able to catch that food and hold on to it. So they have very strong feet with sharp talons on them. Um, they also have a sharp curved beak, and I want to show you a couple of other pictures here. These are baby raptors, these are broad-winged hawks, and you can see even the babies have those sharp curved beaks um, and their talons are getting stronger. And then this is an example of a peregrine falcon. Um, this bird is one that we're gonna talk about later because it's actually the one that we're going to draw. And you can really see well here, you can see that eye, you can see the, the sharp beak and those talons down below, you can see how sharp they are. So these are raptors and So all of this was happening about 100 years ago, like maybe when your great great grandparents were alive. It was quite a long time ago. And people meant really well with the things that they were doing, but they just thought about things a little bit differently than we do now. Um, so bird watchers sometimes didn't like raptors because it's true, occasionally a raptor will swoop in and take a songbird for lunch. Um, that does happen. Um, but, but generally they're taking the slower, the weaker, the sicker animals. Um, when they're doing that. Other people, again, they said that raptors are so common, why should we bother protecting them? But again, rem remember Rosalie's words, the time to save a species is while it's still common. So um, that's no excuse to not protect the raptors, <laughs> the fact that they're common. Um, also, farmers would sometimes get frustrated with raptors because a raptor will, a big raptor, will occasionally take a chicken from a farmer's flock, that's true. Um, but raptors are also going after a lot of rodents like mice and voles and other things that can harm a, a farmer's field. So they're really actually very beneficial. Um, there was a time when um, people really didn't like raptors so much that the, our, our government, the United States government actually would pay money. If you turned in a dead raptor, the government would actually give you money um, called a bounty in, in a reward, sort of a thank you for turning in that raptor. So we were really against raptors. Um, and even soldiers who were preparing to go to war would occasionally use um, raptors as target practice. They would shoot them out of the sky, 
just because we needed something to shoot at and no people thought nobody liked raptors, what does it matter? Now I can guess, I can bet that you know what Rosalie Edge thought of all this, right? Totally unfair, totally wrong, totally not what should be happening. Um, Rosalie really liked words. She, was, she wrote a lot. She wrote a lot of letters and she wrote a lot of newspaper articles. And at this time she directed all of her thoughts toward teaching people more about the importance of raptors, how beautiful they are when they're soaring in the sky, um, all these wonderful things, that they, ways that they can actually help us. And plus just that they're a living thing and they deserve our respect. Um, not only that, but she also encouraged other people to do the same thing. So again, sometimes I think when we think about a hero, we think about somebody who just swoops in suddenly and does this amazing thing all on their own. Well, the truth is that's not usually how good things happen. Usually it takes a lot of people working together, working really hard for a very long time um, to get something accomplished. And that is exactly what Rosalie did. So she taught other people what was going on and then encouraged them to also write letters and also share their information with other people so that this was building all around the country, the support for raptors. That was a new thing back then. Now we kind of take it for granted, but back then it was a brand new way of thinking. Um, now, at some point when Rosalie was learning, Rosalie loved to learn. She was always reading books and learning new things. Um, she went to a meeting to learn more about birds. And I wanna show you a picture that she saw at this meeting. It is, I find it a little bit upsetting, but I think it's important to see. Um, if you don't want to see it, you might look away. So, um, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, just skip. There we go. Um, this is the picture that Rosalie saw at this meeting, and it upset her terribly. Now, this is a photo that was taken back in the 1920s. It is not a recent photo, thank goodness. Um, but these are raptors that people shot from um, a particular ridge in Pennsylvania. And this happened in just a few days. There were people that would go out um, or hunters would gather and when the raptors were migrating, so they were traveling for their summer homes in the north, they were going down to the south to get to find food. Um, they would, uh, people would, sh would, would shoot these birds as they were flying along. Now raptors are very fierce, right? Remember we saw those sharp eyes and their sharp beaks and their sharp talons, but that is no match for, for guns and many thousands of them died. And this happened every fall, year after year after year. That is a lot of birds being killed for no reason. It wasn't like they were harming the people. It wasn't like the people were eating them, anything. There was no reason they were just being killed. Rosalie was very, very upset about this. Um, again, as you can imagine, because this is very unfair and totally not respectful. And once she knew about this problem, she could not get it out of her mind. I think of her sometimes um, almost like a raptor, the way her mind seized on things and just would not let go. Um, that's another thing I really admire about her. Um, so Rosalie told other bird lovers what was going on. And although some of them didn't really see the point in trying to help these birds, some of them did. And they made a plan. Um, somebody was going to go and try to purchase this land to stop the hunters from going up there. Well, it was kind of complicated and people were busy with other things and a lot of time went past and nothing happened. And Rosalie was actually working on this, but she was also working on other things because she did good work all over the country, not just here in Pennsylvania. She actually also helped to add on um, a big forest grove onto Yosemite National Park. She had to ha also helped to establish Kings Canyon out in California. And she was really important in establishing Olympic National Park out in Washington State. So she was busy doing so many things. Um, but when she discovered that nothing had changed with its raptor situation, she couldn't believe it. She, at that point, she couldn't even sleep. And she was so upset. There was another autumn coming soon. She knew the birds were going to get shot again, and she just couldn't stand it. So she and her son actually drove up to the area where the birds were getting shot. And the local people called it Hawk Mountain. And they went up there, but they went in the summer. It was actually, I think I read it was June 3rd. So it would have been, um, you know, right around now when, when this was happening. She and her son went up there, it was quiet. And they looked out over the valley and she could imagine the hunters there. And, and that made her really sad, but she could also imagine this place 
as a quiet, peaceful place, as a sanctuary. And she imagined it as a sanctuary, not just for the raptors, because the raptors are important, but for all living things, for other birds, um, for, for insects, for plants, for the forest, and for the people who would come and visit too. Um, so, um, now to make this dream of hers come true was going to be really difficult. First of all, remember I told you that women had just gotten the right to vote. Now the idea of a woman starting a sanctuary was kind of ridiculous. Nobody had ever done such a thing before. Um, she didn't have the money to do it on her own, but she was able to borrow money from a friend to get the sanctuary started. And eventually, because remember, she had communicated with so many people, when she shared what was going on and they heard about this, people would send donations, maybe even just a dollar or two at a time, if that was all they had. So a lot of this was happening during the Great Depression, when people had just about no money. Um, they would send their small donations, and eventually, Rosalie had enough money to, to make the sanctuary, not just for one year, but forever. She was able to create Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, and Rosalie, again, she did this, and this is part of what makes her a hero. She did this regardless of what other people thought. She was willing to stand up to people, young and old, male or female, it didn't matter to her. When she knew something was right, she went after it. Um, and even when she started the sanctuary, it was still difficult. Because remember, all those hunters that used to come, they still wanted to come. They didn't just say, oh yes, thank you, sanctuary, we're so happy about that. They were not happy about it. They liked their tradition of going up there to hunt. And they, they rebelled in some ways um, that were not so nice. They wrote their own letters in protest of the sanctuary. One of them even hung a dead hawk off a bridge in the area. It was terrible. Um, but Rosalie persisted. Again, she had help. She hired a caretaker, um, Maurice Brune and his wife, uh, Irma Brune, who came to help. And um, in the end, using all her powers, she was able to make the sanctuary a real thing that has lasted now for over 85 years. So um, now I want to think about just a few things that have happened because of Hawk Mountain, because a lot of time has passed since Rosalie established Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, first of all, the mountain is quiet. There's no more shooting. And people are able now to come from around the world. I've been up there when there's people from all different countries, there's school groups, there's so many people who come up to enjoy this peaceful, wonderful place that Rosalie was able to create. Um, there are also students that come from different countries and they are able to learn about raptors and then go back to their countries and teach people there who might not be thinking, you know, raptors are so important. They can teach them about why raptors are so important to save and to help. Also at Hawk Mountain now, we count the raptors. That might seem like kind of a simple thing to just count the birds that are, that are passing by. And I can assure you, having been up there, it is not simple. Sometimes when there's so many at once or they fly by really fast, it's hard to count them and, and to identify them. But that's been going on for a lot of years. And that data has been useful to people even like um, Rachel Carson, who you might have heard of, a very important conservationist who wrote the book Silent Spring. She used data from Hawk Mountain um, to show that some of these raptor populations were declining. So um, there's other experiments that are going on now. Um, I, like Jamie was saying, I help out with the Broadwing project. Uh, people are tagging them to see where they travel. Do they come back to the same area? So there's, there's active research going on right now. Um, Hawk Mountain also serves as a model for other places or in other organizations. If you've heard of the, the Nature Conservancy, that um, buys up land in order to preserve it, that was modeled in part after what Rosalie did at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, so she really set an important example that has lasted. And most importantly, Hawk Mountain is taking action. There's just, there's always things that we can do to make the world a better place. And I'm gonna stop for a second here and, and talk about what you can do to make the world a better place. Um, maybe you go outside. That's really one of the most important things that you can do. Go outside and look and listen and see what, what do you fall in love with out there and, and start learning about them. Maybe there's something that needs your help or that you wanna teach other people about just like Rosalie did. Um, when you come back inside, you can read books. There's a ton of wonderful children's books out there about just about every subject you can imagine about um, animals and science and, and people. Um, so learn more, you know, go, go deeper, learn more. 
ask questions. That is really one of the most important things. There is so much we don't know about the world. And I think kids have this unique perspective. Um, you see the world differently, just like Rosalie did. And we need to hear from you. We need to know what you're curious about. So please ask questions and share those questions. Um, you can also take action. You can start small. Maybe you can talk with your brother and sister and your parents. Um, you can talk with your friends at school or your teachers. Maybe there's some small changes that you can make at home. Um, something as simple as planting milkweed in a garden to help with monarch butterflies. That can be a big help. You can also, if you want, go bigger. Do what Rosalie did, write letters, organize a group of people um, to, to take on a, an important topic that you think more people need to know about. Um, teach other people what you, need, what you know and get them excited about it. Um, if you're really focused, you can maybe even volunteer um, at Hawk Mountain or at a nature sanctuary or someplace near you. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Um, okay, now I wanna take a second here and, and bring in um, Deborah Edge, who is, as Jamie was saying before, Rosalie's granddaughter. And I just had a couple questions for her. I'm so excited that she's able to be <laughs> here with us today. This is such a treat. Mm. Um, and so Deborah, I was wondering when you were, you were really young when you knew Rosalie, but I'm wondering if there are any memories or anything that you would like to share with us today about her. Because you have this personal connection. I can only read about her, but <laughs> you have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really pleased to have a few minutes here to share these thoughts with you about my grandmother. Um, the first thing I want to share with you, and I have to change the screen a little bit, is that I actually now own the, uh, the dragonfly pin or brooch that belonged to her and which you saw in the other picture. She wore it a lot. You can see it on her suit in many of her photos. And it's made out of silver. And then there's turquoise going down here, probably in the early 1900s by a Zuni Indian artist. And it's really fun to have this as a remembrance of my grandmother uh, that I wear. I wear it, I'm on the board of Hawk Mountain and I wear it at every board meeting. I don't <laughs> think I've ever forgotten. Um, and then uh, I thought I would just share a few thoughts from when I was a child. Uh, the moments, some, a couple of moments that I remember about my grandmother, when she came to stay with us at our house, she would get my bedroom and I would move out uh, to another room in the house. And this actually allowed us to have some personal conversations that probably would not have otherwise happened because I would have to come into the room to get my clothes for the day. And one of the things she, I remember her talking to me about was how important it was every morning when you woke up to pull the, um, the, the sheets on your bed all the way back so that the bed could air out and that you should keep your window open at night and also sometime during the day to keep the room fresh and clean. That may not seem important to us now, but she grew up in the late 1800s when there were no antibiotics and it was uh, very, very common actually for people to get an infection and die. So this was a way to stay healthy. She also, I remember one day, showed, said, showed me the, my uh, drawers with underwear and sweaters or whatever and made a huge point about how important it was for a young woman to have scented sachets in their clothing drawers so that they would always smell nice. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure she actually brought, bought me something to use. <laughs> I'd also like, you know, this is a little bit re reiterating what Lisa said, but I've always was aware, even as a child of my mother, grandmother being quite a force to be reckoned with. She learned how to be an organizer and to support a cause when she worked for the women's suffrage movement. And then she used the same skills when she got involved in conservation as she lobbied for conservation issues through, through the committee she founded called the Emergency Conservation Committee. She operated that committee out of her apartment in, her, uh, in New York City. Uh, and then later in 1934, she actually founded Hawk Mountain. She was certainly the first uh, woman and one of the very first conservationists uh, who succeeded so well in what we can now call grassroots organization. Um, and to this day, I'm inspired by her activism and there's all sorts of things that are, are uh, started this way now by individuals. She certainly taught you that an individual can make a difference. 
One of the things she did, which I think is a, a great learning point, is that she personally wrote a thank you note to every single person who donated any amount of money, either to Hawk Mountain or to her emergency conservation committee. Sometimes that was only 50 cents or a dollar, but she always wrote a, a thank you note and mailed that off to everybody. And that is certainly an inspiration and something I must say I still follow today when I'm dealing with those kinds of things. And, you know, I think Lisa's already shared the, what I wanted to say in my final message, which was the most common quote of hers, the time to save a species is when it's common. These few words have inspired many a conservationist and many a conservation movement. Lisa? You can never say that too many times. That is no, an important no. one to remember. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I want to go now to our raptor drawing section. And I'm going to share my screen again so we can see the bird that we're going to draw. And we're going to be um, drawing today a peregrine falcon. Um, peregrines are fascinating animals. Um, first of all, they live on all continents except for Antarctica. So wherever you are, um, unless you're living in Antarctica right now, <laughs> you might be able to see a peregrine falcon. Um, they're also the world's fastest animal. When they're in the stoop dive, when they're hunting their prey, they can get going up to almost 200 miles an hour. So they're super fast. Um, I also think they're really interesting because although they, they normally nest on rocky cliffs, they've discovered that in cities, tall buildings can actually be a little bit like a rocky cliff. And so sometimes even in cities, you can find a peregrine falcon nesting. So wherever you are, uh, you can look for peregrine falcons. Now, get your paper and your um, drawing materials ready. And I'm gonna go back, take a good look at this bird because I'm gonna switch back to my, to me for a second so you can see what, what I'm drawing. Okay, now, one thing with, um, One thing with drawing is that it doesn't always come out right the first time. And that is true, whatever kind of artist you are. Um, so we're gonna make some, I'm gonna use a, a thin Sharpie at first to make some small lines. And then I'm gonna use a thicker Sharpie to go over it. If you're using a pencil, that's actually better because you can erase your lines. I'm just using these Sharpies so that you can see what I'm doing. So when I start out, I'm gonna look at the shape of the bird, especially if you can see this angle here along the back and I'm going to put in a line that shows that angle. And you can do this along with me. Um, then I'm going to put in the head. Now often when you're looking at something and it, it's really interesting to you, you might tend to draw it a little bit bigger than it actually is. So we're going to make a circle for the head and then we're going to go back and look and ask ourselves, is my circle too big or is it too small? Because at this stage you can, you can always still adjust it. So there's my circle and it doesn't, you know, you might not get it right the first time. It's okay to make some extra lines. That's just kind of how drawing works sometimes. Um, now I'm going to look at this part here that comes down um, and we're going to make sort of a straight line that comes down. And then if you notice it, it curves back this direction. So I'm going to take that line back a little bit and then I'm going to put in sort of a, a big ball that represents like a big oval that represents the raptor's body in that space. Okay. Um, now, the next thing I want to do is, right now we're looking at this bird in profile. So we're seeing it from the side. And I'm going to draw a little line showing where the bird's beak is. And I think that my, my head is a little bit big. So I'm actually going to make it a tiny bit smaller here. A little smaller. Here's the bird's beak. And the eye is kind of behind up, it's up a little bit and behind that beak. I'm gonna switch back. I know it's a little bit hard to see. So just let's take a little break and I'll get you back on the, the actual photograph. So you can look at that just for comparison for a second and then I'll come back to my drawing. So there's the bird if you need to catch up a little bit and make some of your lines. And, and you can start to look at um, at the fact that if you look along the back, it's not just a straight line, right? There's actually some curves as you go along the head and the shoulders and the wings. There's actually a little bit of curve there. Um, okay, I'm going to switch back. 
So we can keep going. All right, so we've got our eye. Now, one thing I noticed about that eye is that there's actually a yellow, there's the, the eye itself looks black, but around it is a yellow space. So I'm gonna mark that yellow in so I don't end up coloring it in by accident. There's my yellow space. And I'm gonna extend the tail. I've got my line extended, but the tail about like that. I might start to look at the shape of the forehead up here, which is kind of almost flat. And then it comes back. There's a little dip at the shoulder, a little bump there, and then there's the wing. And let's get that wing in. So that comes around. That, that whole big gray area is the, is the bird's wing. So we're gonna come around and join that up over here. Okay, it still doesn't look very much like a raptor, does it? Partly, that's because we have not included yet the things that make a raptor the most raptory. So we've got the eye on there, but it doesn't really look like a raptor eye and we haven't drawn the beak yet. So let's get that beak in there. Remember, when you're looking at something that's interesting, you might tend to draw it bigger. So one idea is you can draw, look at the actual size of the beak. Let me go back to the, our other um, big image so you can see it. And that beak is not actually very big. We're not drawing a toucan here, right? You don't want it to extend out super far. It's kind of a small beak. And you could actually make a little circle that shows where you want your beak to be, about how big you want it to be. So I'll make my little circle here. And then you can come in. I see that from the bird's head here, there's a little bit of a forehead. And then it curves down at about the same level of the eye, it curves down, it makes a sharp point, and then it comes back in. And then there's a throat, okay, that goes back. The other thing that we haven't talked about yet are these legs, the, the talons. So from this section, I'm noticing this is almost flat here. Bring that out, join it in, and then the talons come out and you can draw those feet on there with the sharp claws. As best you can. Now it might help if you put in a little piece of wood here because it's, it's standing on this branch. That gives it something to hold on to. So you can give it its little branch. And if you want to color that in, okay. Now, I'm going to use, switch to my darker marker now so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. If we, you might notice that a lot of the bird here is gray. First of all, the eye is mostly black. So you can color that in. You might leave a little highlight. And then if you notice up the front of the beak and back is gray. And up this way, it has sort of a gray mustache. It comes back. And then that whole wing area is gray. So you can color that in. I'm going to do it pretty roughly here. You can do it as fast or slow as you want, but I want to get this so you can at least see it. Give that some color. And you might check your shape. Is it the shape you want it to be? And Okay. So there is a peregrine falcon. Um, now, I wanted to take a second. I would love to see what you have done with your birds. So we're going to take a second now, and I would love for you to share your artwork. You can hold it up to your computer screen. Um, Jamie's going to get us set up here so that we can all see what you have been drawing. Yes, and thank you so much, Lisa. You did a fantastic job uh, teaching us how to draw the raptor. It was awesome. All right, I am going to, before I allow the video to be seen so we can see the viewers in the audience, what they've drawn. I am going to pause the recording just so that that's people's faces aren't in the video. So let me do that. We are recording. So okay. I just want to say it was such a treat seeing all the awesome raptor drawings that our viewers made. Great job, Absolutely. everybody. Great. And again, if anybody wants to share those videos on social media, um, whether you're here today with us or watching at some later point, you can always use that hashtag science art writing in that order. It spells out saw if you forget. 
um, and I will try to find you and we can we can share some more about artwork and science and, and writing. That'd be awesome. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is uh, we shared instructions with you for how to make a quick and easy superhero cape. We talked a lot about heroes today. And um, sometimes, even though you already have these powers, sometimes having a cape can sort of make you, can remind you of those powers, can make you feel even, even stronger. So I wanted to show you my cape that I made. Um, this is my superhero cape. It's made from an old t-shirt that was my husband's. I'm gonna put it on. And I use, on my cape, I use my first initial, which is L for Lisa. And so like Rosalie and the Raptors, um, I'm Lisa and I'm protecting leaves. So I would love to know, Start videos. <laughs> you know put it in the chat or whatever, what you're going to put on your superhero cape and what you're going to protect. That would be awesome. Um, I, that's all I have to say right now. I would love to hear if anybody has any questions. Um, we can take questions and answers. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't see that we have any questions. I think everyone was so busy doing the artwork. Um, <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, and I will, um, I'll start talking a little bit about some of the programs that we have coming up. Absolutely. If any questions get sent in during that time, I'll take a break and go to the questions. Okay. I want to thank um, Lisa for an amazing program. I learned so much about Rosalie and the story behind how Hawk Mountain Sanctuary was formed. So thank you so much. Um, for sharing that. And thank you for the awesome drawing lesson. And thank you, Deb, for giving us a sneak peek inside what it was like being the granddaughter of this uh, force of nature, this raptor hero for conservation. So thank you, uh, Deb, for sharing that. And also just a reminder to everyone, um, the email that we sent out earlier with the link to this program also has links about Lisa's books, if you're interested to learn more about that and also links about with more directions about how you can make a variety of different superhero capes on your own. So feel free to re refer back to that email if you want some more information. Thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us today. It's, it's such a treat that you share time with us and we love seeing all the artwork, so thank you. Um, and remember, you can be a, a raptor hero and a wildlife hero too uh, in your own communities. So we encourage you to do that. We hope to see you again soon. We have a lot of other virtual programs coming up soon. Um, tomorrow, Friday, June 5th, we have a program about snowy owls, Voyages of the Snowy Owl at 4 p.m. Next Wednesday, June 10th, we have a program about snakes, slithering snakes at 1 o'clock p.m. And next Thursday, June 11th, we have Sanctuary Storytime, and we're going to be reading the book Percy the Victorious Vulture. And then next Friday, June 12th, we have a program about falcons, the galaxy of falcons. So thank you everyone so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye, thank you. Bye. <laughs>